So a few years ago, specifically in 2012, this particular beautiful planet was reported as the diamond in the sky. It's because it was actually, uh, for the most part, so unusual in every respect, and um, many scientists actually thought that it's almost entirely made out of highly, highly pressurized and very hot carbon, um, essentially the same conditions that create diamonds. And uh, very recent studies uh, actually focused on not just trying to define what's going on on this planet, but to actually completely redefine what we thought we saw here. Today we're going to talk about how this is actually not a diamond planet, but technically a sapphire planet. And essentially a little bit cheaper, but also still just as mysterious and as exciting. And so let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. So this planet is actually known as 55 Cancrii E. It's one of the many, many exoplanets discovered in this particular star system. Um, that's not really that far away from us. Uh, we've discovered this almost like a decade ago, but this particular planet was described in more detail back in 2012. And as you can see from, from what we actually have simulated here, it's already quite a weird looking planet. But uh, the recent study from December of 2018 um, has now established that it's probably even weirder than we thought. Now, the scientists uh, that wrote this paper, and I believe the main investigator is uh, Caroline Dorn uh, from the University of Zurich, and I think also Cambridge participated in this particular study as well, uh, essentially established or discovered three uh, candidates for what they think are completely new exotic types of planets that we've never really kind of analyzed before, never really seen before, or never thought would be possible. Now, um, before I kind of talk about what they discovered, let's actually talk about creation of planets so you understand where they're coming from. Today, most scientists uh, accept the fact that the solar system was formed from a so-called protoplanetary disk. It's essentially a ring of dust uh, that's orbiting the brand new star, such as, for example, our sun. And from this particular ring, uh, with time, all of these planets start forming. We know this almost for a fact because we've actually seen quite a few of them out there in uh, our own galaxy. And uh, we also have even seen new planets being formed around those disks. Very slowly, obviously, but still, um, the actual evidence is definitely there. But in some cases, uh, some of these planets can actually be formed very, very close to the star. And uh, from what we've seen so far, actually, practically everywhere in our galaxy, almost every star we've discovered uh, seems to have these so-called super-Earths um, that orbit very close to the star. These are usually planets that are more massive than our own planet Earth, they're also, um, for the most part, at least lesser in density, but they're most likely super hot. Like, for example, this one here we think is about 3000 degrees Celsius, uh, which is about, uh, I guess, just over half uh, of what our own sun is. And um, we've discovered so many super Earths now that it's, not, uh, it's no longer feasible for us to actually keep calling these planets super Earths because there's just so many differentiations within them. And uh, for this particular study, they've also realized that some of these planets are just way too close. Like, for example, this is one of them, 55 Cancrii E. And the two other candidates are WASP 47E, which I'm going to show you in one second. So here is the WASP 47E. As you can see, it still looks like a typical uh, kind of a gas giant like object, although we now think it's probably something completely different. And the third object has a much stranger name, um, HD 2191-34b. Um, this is actually, I believe, the closest to our own uh, solar system. It's only about 20 light years away from us. And all three of these objects have relatively similar parameters. They're uh, more massive than Earth. They're about 10 to 20% uh, less dense than Earth. And they also are extremely, extremely, extremely hot. And so the idea that they actually speculated about is, well, how is it that these planets were even able to form? And for this particular study, they actually relied on simulations and also our understanding of various uh, chemical elements. And so when you put a bunch of elements in the so-called protoplanetary disk, 
In other words, if I were to take this and just spray it with various types of elements, uh, certain things will start solidifying at various locations around the star system. So like, for example, we know that um, silicates and iron and uh, things like magnesium usually solidify um, at where Venus, Mercury and Earth is, or also Mars, I guess, and they then turn into terrestrial planets. Things that are uh, what we call ices, like methane and um, even hydrogen and helium, will most likely form into planetary objects uh, farther away. So this is where Saturn and Jupiter are. But what if it's like super close to the star? And what they discovered is that, um, well, apparently um, aluminum, or as Americans call it, aluminum, or calcium um, have a tendency to actually still kind of turn into solidified objects there too. In other words, you can, instead of iron, have um, an aluminum core or a calcium core or a mixture of such. And this is what they think is actually happening with these particular objects. So instead of having an iron and uh, nickel core, like our own planet Earth, it basically has uh, quite a large, quite a substantial in size aluminum slash um, calcium core with maybe some magnesium, some silicon and uh, very little, but still some iron. And um, this is actually what makes these particular objects very unique. And the reason they're actually calling them, well, essentially sapphire planets is because, well, for the most part, if you look at the chemical composition of both uh, rubies and sapphires, you'll discover that it's practically um, aluminum oxide. If these planets are filled with aluminum oxide, um, it's quite possible that instead of being carbon planets or basically being diamond planets, they're actually um, similar in color to rubies and sapphires. Um, at the same time, this also creates an idea that the atmosphere here or even the actual planetary structure is probably very different from what we know in our own solar system and very different in the way it behaves and in the way it creates atmospheres and even in the way that this uh, particular atmosphere then interacts with the rest of the planet. For example, such planets would actually have very different cooling uh, behaviors, like they would not actually heat up or cool down in the same way that um, planets like Venus or Earth. So the actual idea of greenhouse gases here might not even uh, exist or exist in a completely unknown to us sort of um, way, in a different kind of a phenomenon. Maybe the planets themselves are actually cool, even if they're so close to the actual star, because of the way that the gases interact with the sun and the planet. Now, obviously, none of this is proven yet. We, we haven't even seen any actual pictures of these planets. So um, there's a lot to learn about these objects, and there's definitely a lot to try to understand about what's happening here. But one thing we can say for almost sure is that um, it's very, very, very likely that none of these planets have any magnetosphere, uh, mostly because um, they're not really magnetic elements, they're not magnetic metals. And you do need a lot of iron to produce magnetosphere, and we think that there is very, very little iron inside of these planets to produce any magnetic field at all. We're also not entirely sure what actually gives them such a low density compared to Earth. Um, there are speculations that it could even be the actual magma itself, the liquid uh, silicates that flow on the surface, creating a kind of a liquid magma ocean. Or it could be very thick atmosphere. So we still need to actually look at those objects to find out what's happening there. And so in a nutshell, these are actually very, very exciting discoveries. And hopefully in the next few years, we'll be able to possibly take an actual direct image of these objects and even see their uh, atmospheric composition to try to understand what's really happening here and if these are actually completely unique and completely original uh, types of super earths that we've never seen before. There are currently three candidates and um, hopefully there will be more coming in the next few years. And if we've discovered something really interesting here, we will then need to try to understand why our own solar system doesn't have this really cool ruby slash sapphire planet. Because that, that would be pretty awesome. But then on the other hand, um, at the end of the paper, the authors also caution us from actually taking this for granted just yet, because this is still a very brand new study, and we're still not sure if these actual objects really exist in the way we just imagined them. It's still quite possible we haven't really understood what's happening here, simply because we don't have anything to compare it to in our own solar system. We don't have any super Earths, we definitely don't have any super hot planets like these, and um, even though a lot of stars do have them, we don't even know why our solar system is so devoid of these objects. Well, on that note though, 
I'm going to wait for another study that hopefully clarifies this in the future, and if you do want to check out this beautiful planet or the other two planets I mentioned, they're all available in Space Engine, the free tool I use for, to make these videos, and also the tool that I actually think you might want to consider supporting um, because it's made completely free by a single person somewhere in the depths and dark forest of Russia. I actually don't even know where the guy lives, I should probably find out. Anyway, so on that note, uh, if you do want to subscribe, uh, do subscribe, and if you want to share this video with someone who wants to learn more about space and sciences, consider doing that as well. And if you want to support the channel on Patreon, it does help me a lot. It helps me buy better food and also buy better clothes and uh, makes my life slightly easier. On that note, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate all of your support. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.